When the History Society was founded 12 years ago, one of its main objectives was to foster new research and scholarship on Newark history. Our success is in attaining this goal is absolutely made clear by tonight's speaker, our president, Tim Christ. Tim, as you know, is president of the Newark History Society. He's also chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Newark Library. Tim earned his PhD at Cambridge University. He taught at Yale. And for the past 30 years, he has been with Prudential Financial. This is Tim's third presentation before the Newark History Society. Earlier talks talked about the founding of Newark by the Puritans in 1666 and the organization of New Jersey College in the 1740s in Newark. As you know, the New Jersey College became Princeton University. Both are available. Both these talks are available on our website. Tonight, Tim continues <laughs> his colonial history search to our benefit, and we're going to hear about Newark in the American Revolution. Tim? Thank you, Warren. The winter of 1779 in New Jersey was one of the coldest on record. The cold started in November, it got colder in December, and the cold continued into the new year. By the middle of January, all the rivers and bays between here and Manhattan had frozen solid. By the 19th of January, uh, the ice between Lower Manhattan and Jersey City was thick enough that heavy artillery could be taken across uh, the Lower Hudson, or the North River, as it was called then. On January 25th, 1780, it was so cold that the Newark militia, responsible every night for patrolling the roads and, and being ready uh, for uh, remaining alert for British raids, decided instead to huddle in the uh, comparative well, well, uh, uh, warmth of the Newark Academy Schoolhouse. Um, and on January 25th, 1780, it was so cold that Joseph Hedden Jr., the Justice of the Peace and Commissioner of uh, Forfeited Estates, who did more than anyone else in Newark to uh, root out British sympathizers, and who in turn was despised by them, remained in his home rather than spend the night in the, uh, uh, with his brother in the relative safety uh, of his brother's home away from town. It was on that frigid night that British troops under the command of Major Charles Lum of the 44th Regiment, strengthened by uh, uh, detachments of Hessian soldiers and guided by locals loyal to the British Crown made a lightning strike into Newark, burned Newark Academy, and captured Joseph Hedden. According to the British account, Major Lum and several hundred troops uh, set out from Paulus Hook um, in Jersey City at about 8 o'clock, marched across the, the roads and the ice arrived here in Newark about three hours later. Lum posted guards on the major roads and then proceeded to the two-story Newark Academy Schoolhouse in present-day Washington Park, then called the Upper Common, where the surprised Newark militia put up a brief uh, defense. Seven or eight militia members were killed. And after setting fire to the schoolhouse, Lum and his troops crossed the green to Joseph Hedden's house, where they rousted him out of bed at Bayonet Point, 
and then marched him and some 36 other prisoners across the ice back to Paulus Hook. Hedden reportedly only had his night clothes to keep, uh, keep off the cold uh, until a sympathetic neighbor tossed him a blanket on the way out of town. They marched down the street here to Mulberry and then out and across to, um, uh, uh, to Jersey City. Weakened by exposure to the severe cold, Hedden's condition worsened during his confinement in the notorious Sugar House prison in Manhattan, and he never regained his health, and he died on September 27, 1780, at the age of 52. The American Revolution is a daunting subject for most of us. It looms large as the formative event from which our, our nation emerged. But there are so many battles, skirmishes, and winter encampments. Then there are the founding fathers, who in popular imagination have become so much larger than life that almost all the life has been drained out of them. At times it seems we are only left with marble statues, public monuments, and the faces engraved on the money in our pockets. We forget that the American Revolution was in many ways a civil war. And of all the 13 colonies, that civil war was perhaps most intense in New Jersey. Civilians were caught for years between the Continental Army and the British troops in Manhattan and on Staten Island. This so-called neutral ground, which ran from Bergen County down through Essex County and on to Monmouth County, Bergen County tilted toward the British. Essex County, which then of course included both Newark and Elizabethtown, leaned strongly toward the American cause. Monmouth County was almost evenly split. In this chaotic and dangerous period, the newly formed New Jersey state government under Governor William Livingston struggled almost on the fly to establish its authority. At great personal sacrifice and peril, uh, Livingston and his Council of Safety attempted to introduce a measure of due process while at the same time securing the state for the American cause. But war can lead to desperate conditions <coughs> that sharply curtail the very freedoms you may be fighting for. There was no freedom of speech in Newark or elsewhere in New Jersey during the American Revolution. No freedom of assembly, no freedom to sell your harvest to the highest bidder, um, or to establish a business of your choosing, and very little freedom of movement. Neighbor fought neighbor. Perhaps even worse, neighbor spied on neighbor, animated often by fierce support for liberty or deeply felt loyalty to the British crown but at other times by old grudges or an eye on the main chance. The story of Newark during the American Revolution is a story of real people facing real decisions with real consequences. And what I want to do with this talk is look at the experiences of several people, both patriots and loyalists, as a way of getting at what the American Revolution meant to civilians in Newark. But let me clear, be clear, I am not attempting a comprehensive review of the American Revolution in Newark. I have only begun my research, and I don't pretend, uh, let me assure Gail here, I don't pretend that I have surveyed all the arch archival material that uh, has survived. What I want to do is work back from that desperately cold night of January 25th, 1780, when the British and Loyalist forces captured Joseph Hedden, and discuss how he came to hold the position that he did, and why Newark Loyalists uh, developed such loathing for him. By focusing on this episode, we may get a sense of why Newark was so bitterly divided during the American Revolution. Just a couple years before the start of the revolution, um, 
Newark was as united as it had been in decades. In 1774, as talk of war was spreading, in the months following the uh, Boston Tea Party, uh, Newark leaders, some who would become ardent patriots and some determined loyalists, worked together in a grand civic project to start Newark Academy and build its handsome schoolhouse uh, in the Upper Common. It was a proud moment in Newark's history and a reminder of how personal the later divisions were. Everybody knew each other. Within two years, everything had changed. Until the summer of 1776, when Governor William Franklin, the last royal governor of New Jersey, was arrested, and the Provincial Congress in New Jersey declared for independence, it had perhaps been possible to remain loyal to King George while opposing the policies of his advisors. But by July 1776, if not before, each Newarker had to make his or her fateful decision whether to remain loyal to the British crown or plunge into the fight for independence. There was no longer any place to hide. Because Newark was in the path of war, you had to choose which side you were on. There was very, um, the little question which side Joseph Hedden, a leading merchant, uh, would be on. His home was up here on Broad Street, uh, about where the Wells Fargo branch is now. Um, his father, who lived for 96 years and was famous for um, taking a generous draft of pure Jersey distilled liquor uh, each morning before getting dressed, uh, was proud that all eight of his sons including Joseph, the tenth of his thirteen children, were fierce patriots during the Revolution. Hedden was a Presbyterian with strong Calvinist beliefs. That's relevant because religious affiliation is probably the best indicator of whether a Newarker would take the patriot or loyalist side. Both in Newark and up on Newark Mountain, as it was known then, the Oranges in Montclair and Verona, Presbyterians overwhelmingly sided with independence. In contrast, nearly all loyalists uh, from Newark were Anglican, although not all Anglicans were loyalists. As best I can tell, uh, pending further research, religious affiliation is a more powerful indicator than education, social status, occupation, whether one lived in the town or on the mountain, or whether one owned slaves. Alexander McWhorter, the minister of Newark's Presbyterian Church from 1759 to 1807, was an energetic, persuasive, and well-traveled supporter of the revolution. He was 42 years old in 1776, and he brought an evangelical fervor and Scots-Irish assertiveness to the cause. In 1780, Anglican uh, clergymen in the middle colonies declared, it is a certain truth that dissenters in general, and particularly Presbyterians and Congregationalists, were the active promoters of the rebellion. They could well have had Newark's Alexander McWhorter in mind. By 1775, McWhorter's reputation was such that the Continental Congress sent him to North Carolina to try to persuade the uh, Scottish settlers there to support the uh, Patriot cause. Like James Caldwell in Elizabethtown and Jedediah Chapman up in the Newark Mountain Society Church, there can be little doubt that McWhorter used his pulpit in Newark to make the case to his congregation for independence from Britain. Other leading advocates um, for independence were also Presbyterians, including William Burnett, a physician who basically ran Essex County during the Revolution, and Caleb Camp, a successful farmer and distiller who was a key state legislator during the Revolution. William Burnett was 45 years old in 1776, 
and a leader in his profession, his church, and his city. His home was on Broad Street, down near Lincoln Park. Uh, uh, Kinney Street runs through what was his property. Uh, Burnett demonstrated competence and good judgment in each task he carried out in the lead up to war. And he took on increasing responsibility in a wide range of political, judicial, and medical roles during the Revolution. On May 4, 1775, he chaired the public meeting when the freeholders and inhabitants of Newark entered into an association to preserve and fix, quote, our constitution on a permanent basis and oppose the execution of several despotic and oppressive acts of the British Parliament. A general committee of 44 men was formed that day with Burnett as deputy chairman. Uh, that was Newark's committee of safety. Uh, and that committee in turn named Burnett to a five-person committee of correspondence for Newark. When the uh, Convention of New Jersey um, uh, convened in June and July 1776 to draft a state constitution and once and for all declare an end to their allegiance to King George III, one of their first acts was to name Burnett one of only three commissioners for the entire state with authority to raise funds for the Patriot cause through bills of credit. He was also appointed one of only nine commissioners in the entire state, the only one from Newark, uh, tasked with purchasing arms for use by the militias. This was only the beginning for Burnett. Uh, he took on an extraordinary range of responsibilities during the revolution, and he provided key backing for the effort to expose and punish loyalists in Newark. And I'm afraid this is the last portrait that I found. It's, um, uh, uh, it is very hard to illustrate a talk from um, uh, the <laughs> era before, um, before uh, photography and before newspapers in the area. Uh, Caleb Camp, um, another Newark Presbyterian, was one of the most prominent patriots in the entire state. And he was just a year younger than Burnett. Camp's family um, were the early settlers of Newark West Farms, uh, later called Camp Town, and now, of course, known as the town of Irvington. Uh, the family's commercial success was based in large part on apples, and the family's business accounts are here upstairs in the New Jersey Historical Society, and they would merit study. As the revolution approached, Camp played an increasingly public role. At a freeholders meeting on December 7, 1774, he was one of 23 men selected for Newark's Committee of Observation. And he chaired the public meeting in January 1775 when they resolved to boycott a New York newspaper um, for its ridicule of the Continental Congress. And again in April, after hearing news of the battles at Lexington and Concord, when they declared their willingness, quote, to risk their lives and fortunes in support of American liberty. In May 1775, Caleb Camp was only one of four Newarkers selected as a deputy to the newly formed Provincial Congress, which became a parallel legislature to the New Jersey Assembly and was one, uh, he was one of the very few to attend all of the, uh, all of the sessions. The instructions to, um, to the four Newark deputies describe the current crisis as one, quote, which will determine the fate of America and decide whether the continent shall be governed by the unlimited will of a Senate in which it has no voice. And then in June 1776, Camp was named one of the five Essex County delegates to the Convention of New Jersey, which again is, is the, uh, the body that took the fateful step toward full independence and adopted a new state constitution. On June 16th, Camp voted for the resolution to arrest Governor Franklin, um, quote, as an enemy to the liberties of this country. Two weeks later, on July 2nd, 
He voted to confirm the new constitution as presented rather than defer it for further consideration. That same week, he was named to a three-man secret committee to, cor to correspond with New York's secret committee and, quote, to issue warrants and apprehend and confine such persons as they may think necessary for the public good. This was one of the first steps in establishing the framework under which Joseph Hedden later operated in punishing loyalists. As I noted earlier, uh, Newark's Anglicans tended to remain loyal to the British crown. They included David Ogden, several of Ogden's children, and Isaac Brown, the rector of Trinity Church, just out here in Military Park. After the start of the revolution, Joseph Hedden went after each of them. David Ogden was 69 years old in July 1776, and for decades had been the leading citizen of Newark. Blessed with a uh, clear head and sound judgment, he was one of the most prominent lawyers of his day in both New York and New Jersey. He had the reputation of outworking everybody else. As a near contemporary noted, up at four in the morning, winter and summer, he had done a day's work before most of his professional brethren were out of their beds. Many of the top lawyers in New Jersey, including Richard Stockton and Cortland Skinner, clerked in his office here in Newark. David Ogden had the same Puritan heritage as William Burnett, Caleb Camp, and almost all the other Newarkers. But he and his family took a different path, linking their fortunes to the provincial government and East, Jer East Jersey proprietors and becoming staunch Anglicans. His father, Josiah Ogden, was the one who famously uh, took in his harvest on a Sunday, was censored by the Presbyterians, and um, in a fit, uh, or in a fit of spite, uh, helped to start uh, Trinity Church. Uh, in 1751, uh, David Ogden was appointed to the governor's council which acted as the upper house in the New Jersey legislature. He remained on the council for more than 20 years while continuing to practice law in New York and New Jersey until he was appointed an associate justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court in 1772. At the same time, he served as moderator of the Newark Town Meeting in 1772 and again the following year. However, with the arrest of Governor Franklin in June 1776 and the adoption of the new state constitution, uh, Ogden lost his seat, of course, on the Supreme Court and turned his efforts to supporting other loyalists and advising the British. Uh, David Ogden's uh, daughter, Sarah, was born in Newark in 1742. She was just 33 years old when, uh, and married to Nicholas Hoffman, uh, the Zion of one of the most uh, successful and prosperous Dutch merchant families in New York, um, when her father lost his seat on the New Jersey Supreme Court. An independent and spirited woman, confident in her views and unafraid to speak her mind, she moved easily in the highest social circles of both Newark and New York. And following her father's example, and probably her own strong inclination, she became a firm loyalist. Uh, David Ogden's son Isaac, the oldest of his uh, four surviving sons, was a young man with a promising future. And he showed every sign of following in his father's footsteps as a distinguished attorney. He um, had been a student at the College of New Jersey in Princeton when one of the revivals came along and news of that uh, reached Newark and his father pulled him out of, uh, out of Princeton as fast as possible and um, sent him over to New York. He uh, uh, was among the first two graduates of King's College, now Columbia University in uh, New York in 1758. 
Um, Og, this Isaac Ogden participated fully in early efforts to oppose the actions of the British Parliament. Um, but he could never bring himself to break his oath of allegiance to King George III. It may have been a close call. His younger brothers Abraham and Samuel chose the Patriot cause. Isaac Ogden succeeded his father as moderator of the Newark Town Meeting in 1774, again when he was just 33 years old. He was selected moderator again in 1775 and 1776. On June 7, 1774, uh, following the decision by Parliament to blockade the Port of Boston, uh, he jointly signed a call to uh, with John de Hart of Elizabethtown uh, to all the inhabitants of Essex County to meet four days later at the courthouse um, uh, here in Newark on Broad Street, quote, to consult and deliberate and firmly resolve upon the most prudent and salutary measures to secure and maintain the constitutional rights of His Majesty's subjects in America. The meeting resolved to boycott uh, British goods and to support, uh, quote, a Congress of Deputies to be sent from each of the colonies, what a few months later became the first Continental Congress. Ogden was then named to a nine-member Essex County Committee of Correspondence to put the resolutions into effect. On May 4, 1775, at the meeting chaired by William Burnett uh, that I mentioned earlier, Isaac Ogden was selected along with Caleb Camp and two others to represent Newark as a deputy to, the New, to New Jersey's Provincial Congress, convened at the request of the Continental Congress, quote, for the purpose of preserving and fixing our Constitution on a permanent basis. <coughs> that same day, Ogden was named to Newark's, Newark's Committee of Correspondence, along with Burnett. So he played a prominent role in Newark's early response to the crisis. But this was a period when Newarkers still talked about the, quote, wished for reconciliation between Great Britain and America on constitutional principles. Ogden may well have hoped that by remaining fully engaged, he could guide and moderate the response. In any event, along with Caleb Camp, he attended sessions of the uh, Provincial Congress in May and June 1775, and again in August. However, he did not attend the sessions in October or the following January. He had gone as far as he could in challenging the acts of the British Parliament, but he could go no further. The split between the Presbyterians and Anglicans in Newark uh, extended to the clergy. And in contrast to Alexander McWhorter, the Reverend Isaac Brown, rector of Trinity Church, was a firm loyalist. By 1776, he had served Trinity Church uh, for 29 years. And having led prayers for decades from the Book of Common Prayer, for God to strengthen his most gracious sovereign that, quote, he might vanquish and overcome all his enemies, uh, Brown was not about to deny loyalty to his king. Brown and the other loyalists in Newark must have been encouraged in the summer of 1776 by Britain's extraordinary show of force uh, in New York Harbor. 30 warships and 400 transport vessels along with 33,000 soldiers and sailors. At the same time, Newarkers who had declared for independence must have been deeply sobered as they prepared for war. All Newarkers on either side were drawn into the vortex of war following the crushing defeat of Washington's army at the end of August 1776 uh, at the Battle of Long Island in Brooklyn Heights. In his role as the uh, chairman of the Essex County Committee at this point, William Burnett received orders from General Washington on September 12th to establish a hospital in Newark for as many as a thousand sick and wounded who would be transferred from New York City. To that end, Burnett requisitioned the use of 
the Presbyterian Church, Trinity Church, the Courthouse, and Newark Academy. He had to work quickly because the British captured New York just three days later, on September 15th. More British successes followed quickly. They took Paulus Hook in Jersey City on September 23rd. Then in October, Washington's army suffered further setbacks in Manhattan and in the uh, Battle of White Plains. On November 7th, George Washington <laughs> wrote to William Burnett, warning that General, the British General Howe would likely send a detachment of British troops into New Jersey. In his role, again, as chairman of the Essex County Committee, Burnett passed along the warning to residents three days later. Uh, in my view, his notice is a model of clarity and urgency. His Excellency General Washington advises all who live near the water to be ready to move their stock, grain, carriages, by which he means wagons, and other effects back into the country. He adds, if it is not done, the calamities we must suffer will be beyond all description, and the advantages the enemy will receive immensely great. They have treated all here without discrimination. The distinction between Whig and Tory has been lost in one general scene of ravage and desolation. The article of forage is of great importance to them. Not a blade, he says, should be left. What cannot with convenience be removed must be consumed without the least hesitation. November 1776 was one of the real low points of the American Revolution. The odds against victory for the colonists, never high to begin with, had become almost overwhelming. General Washington's New York campaign ended disastrously uh, in the middle of the month, and with the remnants of his troops, he began a steady retreat, as you know, across New Jersey, with Lord Cornwallis and the British Army in pursuit. In Fort Lee, Cornwallis got so close that Washington's troops escaped only by leaving behind their guns, hundreds of tents, and even their breakfast cooking on the fire. After crossing the Hackensack and Passaic rivers, um, Washington's armies reached Newark on November 22nd. The soldiers were not an impressive sight. Many men had no shoes, and their feet were wrapped in rags. No doubt many were planning their journeys home, since for two-thirds of them, their enlistments ran out at the end of the month, and they would be free to go. It was raining hard when the troops reached Newark and set up camp. The soldiers had no tents, having left them behind in Fort Lee, so they were exposed to the cold and wet as the rain continued that night and the next day. <coughs> By tradition, it was while with Washington's army camped in Newark that Thomas Paine began writing his um, essay, The American Crisis, that begins with his famous call to patriotism. You know the words. But listen to them again and consider the desperate uh, uh, state of the war effort when Paine started to write them. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. The rains that had made the encampment miserable for Washington's army also slowed the advance of the British army, who found the uh, roads between Fort Lee and Newark uh, almost impassable for their heavy artillery and baggage. Cornwallis and his army finally arrived in Newark about 1 p.m. on November 28th, but Washington's troops had already retreated, so no battle took place. 
Uh, Newark's loyalists had much to celebrate during this period. Major General James Grant, one of the ablest British generals and a skilled military strategist, took up his quarters at David Ogden's mansion on Broad Street while the British forces were in Newark. I presume Ogden and his family entertained General Grant and maybe Lord Cornwallis and other senior officers. Perhaps they even encouraged the British to take steps against leaders of the local rebellion against the crown. The sort of iron-fisted action meant both to punish, uh, punish and to discourage others. What we do know is that three years later, Ogden held the view that, quote, laying the country waste was completely justifiable, quote, in cases of rebellion. In any event, the British ransacked houses and captured supplies before quitting Newark. If the reports that have come down to us can be taken at anything close to face value, atrocities were committed, and even some loyalists had their homes plundered. Alexander uh, McWhorter's uh, house was ransacked, and the church records, going back to the founding of Newark, were destroyed. Uh, Caleb Camp, and I'm sorry, I thought this would be much clearer. For you in the back, you can't begin to read this. Um, Caleb Camp appears to have gotten off lightly. Uh, in um, the late 1780s, uh, New Jersey residents were encouraged to submit claims for damages from um, the British troops or their uh, adherents. Uh, Camp got off fairly lightly this uh, you know, he lost two cattle that were two years old and five cattle yearlings, uh, nine geese, uh, and four horses uh, of different um, ages, and uh, kind of clothing and bedding, sheets, stockings, um, uh, pillowcases and such. Um, however, it's clear that William Burnett was targeted. His household and shop furniture uh, were damaged. Uh, so damages uh, to the dwelling house by the enemy, 60 pounds. Medicines destroyed, uh, 50 pounds. Shop furniture, another 50 pound claim. He also lost 300 bushels of Indian corn uh, on the ear. Uh, 15 tons of, uh, of uh, best English hay. He uh, lost a riding sleigh. Uh, four gross of quart bottles, uh, presumably for his medical practice. I like this one. Three cases uh, of bottles filled with cherry rum. Um, he also lost uh, his books, 50 pounds, and he lost, uh, which were probably a bit of a treasure for him, five large maps um, uh, containing uh, the four quarters and the globe. Uh, however, um, he also submitted a supplemental claim and in his view, his most important property lost was one Negro man whom he valued at 100 pounds. Uh, we don't know whether Burnett's slave continued in service to the British or whether he was one of the slaves who was granted his freedom and then fought with the British. But it is a reminder that the colonists' battle for independence and self-determination did not uh, extend to slaves. It took another civil war to achieve that. On November 30th, uh, 1776, just two days after the British occupied Newark, uh, General Howe, the British general, offered a pardon to those who took an oath of loyalty to the crown. And David Ogden later reported that he used his utmost endeavors in persuading the people to come in and take the oaths to the king. And he claimed that all, he had so much success that only 26 Newarkers did not take the oath. Who can blame them? The state government was in almost complete disarray. Uh, Governor Livingston had gone into hiding. No one knew where he was. Alexander McWhorter had left with Washington's army and I suspect William Burnett had made himself scarce. Toward the end of December, 
Alexander McDougall, Brigadier General of the 1st New York Regiment, uh, described the chaos in New Jersey in a letter to uh, George Washington. This state is totally deranged, <laughs> without government or officers or military in it that will act with any spirit. Many of them have gone to the enemy for protection, others are out of the state, and the few that remain are mostly indecisive in their conduct. However, the surprise victories uh, by Washington's army in Trenton on December 26 and in Princeton on January 3rd changed everything, at least in Newark. The last remnant of British forces in Newark evacuated after the battle in Trenton and the New, Jer New Jersey militia retook possession of Newark. When David Ogden and Isaac Brown got news of the British defeat at Princeton, and the news traveled fast, they recognized the danger they were in and fled to New York City on January 5th without putting their affairs in order or securing their property. Ogden suggested in a court proceeding two years later that, quote, he went over to Jamaica in Long Island to recover his health, uh, but that was merely a smokescreen. He fled from Newark to avoid retribution and he was smart to do so. Continental troops came to his house on January 6th, and as Ogden later claimed, plundered and destroyed a great part of his, of his most valuable effects. One loyalist lamented toward the end of January, no man dares to express his opinion relative to this mob government without incurring the forfeiture of all his property and the confinement of his, per of his person to prison. That lament describes the fate of Isaac Ogden, who around this time was captured, charged with high treason, thrown into prison in Newark, and later transferred to Morristown. But like other members of his family, having chosen his course, he now did not give an inch. After questioning him in April uh, 1777, Alexander Hamilton called Isaac Ogden the most barefaced, impudent fellow that ever came under my observation. He openly acknowledges himself a subject of the King of Great Britain and flatly refused to give any satisfaction to some questions that were put to him. Isaac Ogden remained in prison for at least seven months until at some point he was discharged, escaped, or took part in a prisoner exchange and went to New York City. Uh, Isaac Brown was a more trusting man, and he suffered for it. He took George Washington's proclamation on January 25th concerning loyalists at face value, when Washington declared that loyalists had, quote, full liberty to withdraw themselves and their families within the enemy's lines. According to a report in the New York Gazette, a loyalist newspaper, Brown returned to New Jersey and immediately wrote to Washington asking for permission to withdraw himself and his family to New York under the terms spelled out in the proclamation. Instead, Brown was arrested and jailed in Morristown, leaving his family, as the report uh, continued, almost distracted with worry. In due course, Brown was also released and went to New York City. Governor Livingston struggled to bring a measure of due process to the arrests of loyalists. In March 1770, the Council of Safety was established with executive power to deal with the breakdowns in local justice and threats from loyalists. Caleb Camp was one of the original 12 members of that Council of Safety. In early June, as the state government began to get some traction, the legislature offered loyalists a free and general pardon and restoration of their rights if they took an oath of allegiance to the state. And at the same time, the Council of Safety named three commissioners in each county of the, of the state to take local responsibility for dealing with loyalists and preventing them from providing intelligence and aid to the enemy. Well, perhaps based on Caleb Camp's um, recommendation, the Council of Safety named Joseph Hedden, Jr., a commissioner for Essex County on June 24, 1777. Hedden set right to work 
and over the next two and a half years he proved to have in abundance all the attributes necessary um, to carry out his tasks and make life miserable for Newark loyalists. He had an unwavering commitment to the Patriot cause, a prosecutor's uh, tenaciousness in seeing his caseload through to judgment, and a merchant's organizational and bookkeeping skill to manage the disposition of vast amounts of property. His task as a commissioner was to identify loyalists who refused to take the oath of allegiance or who had gone um, over to New York City and were in, under the protection of the British troops. Um, make the case to a jury of 24 men for a verdict of high treason and get at least 12 of the jurors to agree. And then with the verdicts in hand, he could confiscate their property, uh, manage the sale of both property and goods from each estate, and, do co and in due course turn over the proceeds to the state. The sales of loyalist estates proved to be a primary source of funding for the state of New Jersey during the war. It appears, however, that the urgency of the moment somewhat ra uh, sometimes raced ahead of the, um, of the um, uh, evolving, to put it nicely, uh, due process. And that certainly was the case for David Ogden. Three auctions of his goods and the sale of rents from some of his lands took place as much as nine months before the case against him for high treason was presented to a jury. In 1778 and 1779, trials took place in Essex County for 120 loyalists, probably a quarter or a third of whom were Newarkers. David Ogden's case was brought in the very first group on the very first day on June 8, 1778, with the charge that he did go into the enemy's lines and aid and assist the King of Great Britain's troops. Ogden's son Abraham, who had chosen the uh, Patriot side and who would later be named the first U.S. Attorney for New Jersey by President uh, George Washington, entered a plea of not guilty on his father's behalf. It made no difference. Eighteen jurors affixed their seals and signed their names to a guilty verdict. Abraham Ogden entered a similar plea for his brother Isaac the next day with the same result. Isaac Brown's case reached the jury two days after that, and he was also found guilty. For the Ogdens, um, these proceedings mostly had the effect of confirming them in their support for the British. As Isaac Ogden put it into, in a letter in February 1779, uh, and, and noting that the state of New Jersey had passed this law that anybody under the protection of the British Army would be charged with high treason. Uh, he writes, in consequence of this law, my father and myself, with many others, have had judgments entered against us, and our estates declared forfeited, and our real estates advertised for sale on the 1st of March. Uh, this is no more than I expected and is of little moment or importance, as without the restoration of government, I could never expect to enjoy them. Uh, it was of little importance because at this point, Isaac Ogden still fully expected the British to crush the rebellion. A couple months earlier, following the British capture of Philadelphia, he provided his analysis of the war in another letter. The rebellion hangs by a slender thread. The majority of the inhabitants are dissatisfied with their tyrannical government. Their money is depreciating. The French alliance is, in general, detested. Provisions are scarce, and that scarcity is increasing. In this situation, what is necessary to crush the rebellion? It is easily answered. One vigorous campaign, properly conducted. The Loyalists in New York were always feeling there was one vigorous campaign away from turning the war around. As Ogden had noted, uh, Joseph Hedden and his fellow commissioners had advertised a major sale of forfeited estates beginning March 1st. And uh, the, uh, their advertising line was that the sale would include some elegant houses 
uh, and many agreeable situations. The land is excellent and the place healthy. Um, the first sale took place at jo uh, Captain Josiah Pearson's house in Newark. Three other property sales followed in March, with two more in April. Altogether, um, and you probably can't read this either, but uh, altogether the commissioners sold 46 different parcels of David Ogden's property. He was a major landowner in Essex County. To 39 different buyers in those six sales. Far more than for any, for any other loyalist in Essex County. And let me just point out two of them. Um, let's see, this house and home lot. Um, his, uh, David Ogden's house uh, stood on a three-acre lot between Trinity Church and Old First, somewhere along here on Broad Street. Um, a con a contemporaries described a large stone mansion house, and in addition there were stables, a garden, a coach house, and various other structures on the property. Joseph Hedden's son, Israel, bought it for 1,450 pounds. The uh, parcels, uh, these two parcels here, half the lot uh, before Josiah Pearson's, I think were the eight-acre lot that uh, Ogden later described as being in high cultivation with orchards and a large barn, again on Broad Street. Um, altogether, the uh, sales of... Um, of Ogden's lands uh, in this two-month period raised over 24,600 pounds for New Jersey state government. And you can see there, let's see, um, Horse Neck, that's the Caldwells, um, Passaic River, um, maybe it was on the other page, here's Little Falls, he owned property in Little Falls as well. Um, these proceeds, this 24,606 pounds, do not include uh, the results from other sales of his assets, including his supply of tea and sugar uh, in June of 1778, his wood, that was a big sale, um, several hundred pounds, on February 8, 1779, and hay from his properties in March. Isaac Ogden only owned one piece of property, unlike his father, his house which sold for 900 pounds, and Joseph Hedden bought it. <laughs> Isaac Brown, I don't think, uh, owned property. His modest goods, including a bed and quilt, a handsaw, and a couple harnesses, were sold on November 10, 1779. Uh, Nicholas and Sarah Ogden Hoffman's goods were sold on February 5, 1779, brought more than 137 pounds including the 10 shillings that Joseph Hedden paid for a tea board. As you know, title to property in those days was uh, held only by men, except in the case of widows. But Joseph Hedden found a way to go after Sarah Ogden Hoffman directly. During a conversation um, on September 30th, 1778, presumably at the sale that Hedden was conducting that day of her father's goods. Um, Sarah Ogden Hoffman said, or at least uh, Hedden recounted later, I desire to go to New York myself, the first opening, and I will persuade my husband to come to New York as soon as I am there. I am sure and certain the British troops will conquer America, and I was always what you call a Tory. I have informed General Washington and General Greene oftentimes that my sentiments were against the American cause. I assume those, these conversations with Washington and Greene took place in Morristown at her brother Abraham's house where Washington was a frequent visitor. So the following April, uh, Hedden persuaded William Patterson, who was then the uh, Attorney General for New Jersey, to bring a misdemeanor indictment against Sarah Hoffman for seditious words. Those were the words I just showed you. She was described in the indictment, and I know you can't read this, uh, Sarah Hoffman, late of Newark, in the county of Essex, wife of Nicholas Hoffman, being a pernicious and disaffected woman, 
and a person of a turbulent mind and uh, seditious disposition and uh, conversation. Um, and Hedden was the only witness against her. Where is he? Now, this is Hedden's name down here. Um, and with his testimony, the jury uh, returned a true bill on this indictment. Uh, Sarah Ogden Hoffman was not easily cowed, and having been charged, she merely pleaded guilty, as if to say, of course, those are my views, and I have not yet found what her punishment was, if any. So given the experience of David, Isaac, um, Sarah Ogden, and of Isaac Brown and of no other Newark loyalists at the hands of Joseph Hedden uh, and the other commissioners, it comes as no surprise that the British and loyalist troops who marched into Newark on that bitterly cold night in January 1780 were intent on capturing him or that they treated him so roughly. Nor is it a surprise that when Brit British troops raided Newark again several months later, they captured Samuel Hayes and Thomas Canfield, the other two commissioners of for forfeited estates for Essex County. William Burnett, for one, was convinced that Isaac Ogden, Sarah's husband Nicholas, and Isaac Brown's son Peter had planned that second raid during a visit to Elizabethtown under a flag of truce just a few days before. Uh, Burnett lobbied strenuously with Governor Livingston to arrange a prisoner exchange to gain Hedden's release. And in particular, he suggested uh, a prisoner exchange for Nicholas Ogden, Ogden, another one of David Ogden's sons. But as Burnett wrote to Livingston, poor Mr. Hatton, I really pity him and think he has been much neglected by his friends. It is hard to suffer so much for serving the public and is very discouraging to the few remaining in office who dare to assert themselves for it to see so little notice taken of him in his distress. The public good, as well as his sufferings, call aloud for his relief. But what I did find surprising is that Isaac Ogden and his fellow Newark loyalist Isaac Longworth uh, served as witnesses to Hedden's will two weeks after his capture. They must have visited him soon after his confinement in the Sugar House prison. But if there is a record of what they discussed, I haven't found it yet. And as I noted, uh, Hedden did not recover uh, from his exposure to the severe cold, and he died the following September. I want to close by quickly relating what happened to the people I've mentioned in this talk. I said earlier that uh, the story of Newark during the American Revolution is one of real people facing real decisions with real consequences. In 1774 and 1775, in the lead up to the revolution, Burnett, Camp, and McWhorter were allied with the Ogdens, or at least with Isaac Ogden, in opposition to acts of parliament imposing taxes and other punitive measures on the colonies. But as war broke out, they were each forced by events to choose one side or the other, even as those sides became uh, more fixed and positions more extreme as Newark was caught for years in the neutral ground. It became a bitter, zero-sum, one-side-take-all conflict. And once the war ended, they each had to find some way forward. But for those whose side lost, like the Ogdens, the way forward no longer centered on Newark. After the war, David Ogden went to England, and he eventually secured payment of 9,000 pounds sterling and an annual pension of 200 pounds from the British government for the losses he had suffered and for his long service to the crown. He returned to America in 1790 and settled on Long Island Although he visited Newark on occasion, he died in 1798 at the age of 91. Isaac Ogden also went to England after the war, but in 1788 he moved to Canada following his appointment as judge of the Admiralty for Quebec. 
In due course, he served as a justice of the Court of the King's Bench in Montreal. Toward the end of his life, he returned to England, where he died in 1824 at the age of 85. Like so many other loyalists, the Reverend Isaac Brown and his wife went to Canada after the war, to Nova Scotia. But it seems to have happened so often uh, for that unfortunate couple, things did not go at all well. During the voyage to Nova Scotia, their ship was hit by a fierce storm and most of his goods were lost. He survived for a few years on a small pension until his death in 1787 at the age of 78. Sarah Ogden Hoffman and her husband Nicholas settled in New York City after the war. She was clearly an extraordinary woman who deserves closer study. After her husband's death, she took a leading role in the Society for the Relief of Widows with Small Children, known more succinctly as the Widows Society, which she served as the second director. She was also the driving force behind the formation of New York's Orphan Asylum in 1806 and served as its first director. These were pioneering social service organizations. Whether you're looking at England or the, or the United States, these were two of the very first and she was in their leadership. And I suspect there's more than a casual link between her work in New York and the formation of the Newark Female Charitable Society in 1803, now known, of course, as the Newark Day Center, which is perhaps the oldest social service organization in New Jersey. Sarah Ogden Hoffman died in 1822 at the age of 78. Alexander McWhorter returned to Newark in 1781 after a couple years' absence and continued his ministry at the Presbyterian Church. From 1787 to 1791, he presided over the building of the magnificent stone church uh, that, of course, still stands on Broad Street. Caleb Camp was a member of his building committee. McWhorter was instrumental in resurrecting Newark Academy. And I know you can't read this either. Uh, the surviving trustees, Alexander McWhorter, William Burnett, Caleb Camp, Crane and Alexander Eagles uh, submitted a, a claim um, uh, on behalf of the town of Newark uh, for their new elegant building burnt with the fences, etc., a claim of 1,400 pounds, uh, which they never collected. Um, McWhorter earned a national reputation of, as both a preacher and an educator in the years leading up to his death in 1807 at the age of 73, having presided over Old First for 48 years. In addition to serving on the Council of Safety during the war, Caleb Camp was Speaker of the Assembly in 1779. After the war, he was twice Sheriff of Essex County, and he served again in the state legislature in 1793. Later in life, he often served as one of the overseers of the poor, for the town of Newark. He died in 1817 at the age of 85. Like everyone else who submitted a claim to the state of New Jersey, he never received any compensation for the damage he sustained to his property by the British or the Loyalists. On top of his executive and judicial roles in Essex County during the war, William Burnett twice represented New Jersey in the Continental Congress, and in the final years of the war, he served as Surgeon General at West Point for the entire Eastern Department of Washington's Army. After the war, he returned to Newark and resumed both his medical practice and his prominent role in civic matters. Burnett died suddenly in 1791 at the age of 61. He left a large family, including his sons Jacob and Isaac, who were instrumental in the founding of Cincinnati, and his youngest son, David, who in 1836 became the first president of the Republic of Texas. Uh, Joseph Hedden's uh, family uh, uh, submitted a claim of 360 pounds for war damages, but like 
all the other claimants, they did not receive any compensation. Uh, his oldest son, Israel, uh, apparently moved into his house opposite Washington Park in April 1781, uh, and you won't have a prayer reading this, um, uh, laws were passed that uh, in order to try to restrain any trade with the British, uh, that you needed to get a license to keep a shop uh, or to carry on a business, and you needed to demonstrate your loyalty uh, to the American cause. Um, uh, he uh, petitioned um, uh, saying that uh, he wanted to keep and open a shop and store at the dwelling house where he now lives at the upper end of the town of Newark for the sale of European and West Indian goods. And he noted that he had, regularly, he had been regularly brought up to the business of shopkeeping, presumably by his father Joseph. He needed at least 15 signatures to prove that he was, uh, that's what this says, a singular friend to his country. Uh, he got 20, uh, including William Burnett, Jr., down here, who uh, was standing in for his father, who was then at West Point, and Caleb Camp. The uh, notation on the endorsement on the side is that his petition was granted. Uh, Joseph Hedden was buried at Old First in the graveyard there. His epitaph captured in stone the strong emotions that divided Newark during the American Revolution. It read, in part, he was a firm friend to his country in the darkest times, zealous for American liberty, in opposition to British tyranny, and at last fell a victim to British cruelty. When most of us think of the Revolutionary War, we tend to think of Lexington and Concord, of Valley Forge, and of Yorktown. We forget that when the war came in 1776 to Newark and other places in New Jersey, New Jersey's neutral ground. It stayed for nearly eight years, unlike almost anywhere else in the colonies. It stayed because the British maintained control of New York City until 1783. Newarkers and other New Jersey residents in the neutral ground had to deal for years with the constant threat of British and loyalist raids, and with the constant demand of both the British and Continental armies for food and supplies. There was something of the modern guerrilla war in this area's experience of the Revolutionary War, and it deeply affected people on both sides of the conflict. When 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, they pledged, as we all know, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. But they were not alone. So did Newark patriots like Joseph Hedden, Alexander McWhorter, William Burnett, Caleb Camp, and many others I could have mentioned. And if I may, so did Newark loyalists like the Ogdens, Isaac Brown, and again, many others I could have mentioned. The Revolutionary War in Newark was a searing experience. It pulled the social fabric apart and upset the normal functioning, functioning of civic life in the courts and town government. Farming and commerce were disrupted. The regular patterns of worship turned upside down. Due process was often a step or two behind the actions of authorities. In November, 1789, just six years after the end of the war, New Jersey became the first state to ratify the Bill of Rights to the New Jersey Constitution, or to the United States Constitution. And the question that occurs to me, and perhaps some of you know the answer, I haven't been able to look into it yet, but I wonder if the intensity of New Jersey's experience during the war had something to do with this state's affirmation of the freedom of religion, speech, and the press, of the rights of assembly and petition, of protection from unreasonable searches and seizures, from being deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, or having, from having property taken for public use without compensation. 
given the absence of those freedoms and the loss of those protections for civilians in Newark and elsewhere in New Jersey on both sides during the long years of war, I'm pretty sure it did. Thank you. I suspect I've exhausted you, but if there are questions, uh, I'll see if I know the answer. George. Uh, one quick question and one a little bit longer one. Uh, what was the approximate population of Newark in the Revolution? And then the other question is, you know, you, you showed that uh, those sales of Loyalist property, um, do you have a sense of how that was valued? Um, was, was this a case of Hedden? and his pals selling it off to themselves at knockoff prices, or, you know, was that, was that part of what's going on? Um, um, George, my sense is there were probably about, uh, probably about three or four thousand people living in Newark, by which I mean as today's Essex County. Um, the, uh, uh, the challenge, the, the fact that 30, there were 39 different buyers for Ogden's property suggests that it wasn't all manipulated. Uh, the value of uh, those, uh, uh, I was going to say dollar amounts, the uh, pound sterling amounts are hard to interpret because the money was, was depreciating so fast uh, during the war. Uh, one of the challenges um, in selling the property was that you had to have kind of cash on the barrel. Um, you could not take out a mortgage or a loan to acquire the po property. You needed to be able to come up with the, um, um, uh, with the money at the time. So the group of residents with sufficient resources to do that was relatively small. Um, by the way, it's something like uh, uh, the total uh, raised for the state of New Jersey, if I remember correctly, was something like a million three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. It basically funded uh, the confiscation of oil. This property basically funded the state government during these years. By far, the largest amount was down in Monmouth County. Um, so, but at the same time, uh, and I was highlighting what Head and Bot and, um, uh, uh, but it was it was fairly widespread. I mean, I would imagine it's a really a risky thing for them to do because there was no, if the British had won, they would have... Well, their lives were on, on the line at this point, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. During but, this period, did the seat of New Jersey's government move? Well, let's, let's put it this way. The Council of Safety was meeting all over the state. Uh, sometimes in Elizabethtown, sometimes in Princeton, sometimes in Burlington, and I don't think that was just to be politically correct. It was, it was, it was shifting around. I don't, uh, and but I, to be frank, I don't. Does anybody know where the legislature was uh, meeting in those days? Where did Governor, Governor Livingston? He was in Elizabethtown. Uh, and one of the ways they're connected, his um, sister. Uh, was Nicholas Hoffman's uh, mother-in-law. So uh, he had to navigate these personal um, uh, connections and be absolutely scrupulous about not giving favor or to, um, to the Ogdens or the Hoffmans or others uh, who were family relations. Yeah, Walter. A little side tip is interesting to note that several downtown Newark streets Bear the names of these. Yeah, absolutely. Like right? Water Street, uh, Burnett, that's yeah. from here. And Camp. Yeah, they all are. Yeah. Head and Terrace. There's Head and yeah, Terrace. Yeah. Christopher was telling me about the Headens over in Maplewood and South Orange. Uh, uh, that's where the most of the Headens lived at that period. Uh, others will know better than I the Headens remained, the family, or various branches of it, remained active in Newark certainly through the 19th century with their construction companies and built uh, many of the uh, larger buildings in, um, in Newark uh, through the end of the 19th into the 20th century at least. Yeah, Linda? Uh, I'm assuming that the Ogdens founded Ogdensburg. Do you know if there's any connection 
I'm so glad I read something about that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that Abraham Ogden was, uh, let's see if I can remember this, uh, had the task of, of uh, uh, negotiating with the Iroquois and, and subsequent to that acquired some of the land up in that area and one of the other buyers in that consortium was Nicholas Hoffman. But it was, it was Abraham Ogden and it was, it was that branch of the uh, Ogden family up in Ogdensburg, New York. Gail. <laughs> it will indeed be posted with the footnotes, Gail. I love a good footnote, and um, I had to prune this into some reasonable length, and so all the good stuff went into the footnotes. And, and, and this time I was smart enough to complete the footnotes rather than go back and try to do them months later. So it will, if Bob Hartman and I figure out how to do it, we'll post it fairly quickly. Yeah. Well, the the uh, others may know the answer better than I. The um, certainly um, uh, what are there four or five New Jersey signers of the Declaration of Independence, so they certainly went along with it. New Jersey was just kind of slow yeah. to focus on all this. Uh, you know, Massachusetts was in the lead, Connecticut, Virginia, um, and that makes it perhaps all the more ironic that. Uh, the war settled in this uh, New Jersey, New York area. No, I, I thought I had heard maybe it was from a movie that was from 1776. They seemed to give the impression that for the Constitution, Congress, they, they couldn't find New Jersey. They were a little slow. New Jersey was, was perhaps a little slow, but um, uh, it did come around. Uh, and if I can remember, the votes of that um, uh, convention in uh, early uh, July, a lot of people did not want to vote, actually have their names recorded uh, as voting for the new constitution. Um, um, uh, Caleb Camp's name is listed second or third, so, uh, and I don't know the, whether the order in which uh, the names are listed in the records represents the order in which they voted, but he, uh, he was one of those who was willing to uh, take that uh, rather uh, uh, risky step at that point. Yeah, Linda? You mentioned the extensive land holdings um, of the Ogdens and others, and I'm just wondering, do you have any idea how prevalent slave labor was in York during that, that time of the war? Um, Well, the short answer is I don't know, but um, uh, it certainly was a part of the fabric of Newark at that time. Certainly Aaron Burr had a slave who went down to Princeton with him. Ogden got most of that property, um, if you heard my talk about um, the 1740s and 1750s, as an attorney to the East Jersey proprietors, and they claimed a lot of that land in Little Falls and Horseneck and other that had that had been squatted on or settled by um, residents of Essex County, and in the end he was successful enough to claim for himself clearly several hundred acres. Um, that would not have been uh, cultivated much. Uh, it would have been primarily a source of timber and, and things like that. Um, the instance, as I'm aware, Linda, and I am. You know, one of these days when I don't have a day job, I'm, I'm going to be very interested in exploring this a little further. Uh, the instance of slavery, as best I can tell, was greater um, oh, on the uh, Schuyler Estate, uh, Belleville, kind of Nutley area, the uh, mine up there, and, and across the river. There were, uh, in the early days, there were West Indian landowners who moved to this area. They called it Little Barbados. Um, and, and there was greater uh, instance of slavery there. On the other hand, William Burnett, um, I hope I'm right on this, um, after his death, 
there was some action to uh, provide manumission to his ten slaves. So he was up to ten um, by 1791. And that certainly would have been in property around here. Nope. I've exhausted that. One. <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for that brilliant talk. <laughs>